Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the annual Kernel Talk, back by popular demand after last year's hiatus and incredibly poor quality substitute. Please welcome Ben Hutchings with what's new in the Debian Kernel. Uh, first, a little bit about myself. Uh, I have been working on the Linux kernel and related, related code uh, like initRamFS and firmware packaging. Uh, I've been doing this for Debian uh, and in my paid jobs for over 10 years now. Uh, I'm a member of the Debian kernel team doing about half of the packaging work now, counting by commits. And uh, I'm also on the long-term support team uh, doing mostly the kernel backports uh, sorry, the kernel uh, updates for uh, the long-term support suite. Uh, I also maintain the uh, Linux 3.16 stable update series on kernel.org uh, and used to do the same for 3.2. Basically, I look after the versions that we are using in older releases. Uh, and I'm maintaining a stable branch based on Linux 4.4 for the civil infrastructure platform. Uh, as you might know, Linux releases early and often, uh, about five times a year in fact, uh, with stable updates with bug fixes uh, even more often than that, every week or so. Sometimes when features appear in the kernel, they aren't quite ready, uh, there are bits missing which may uh, be filled in in a later release. Uh, sometimes they also require some support from user space packages uh, and other changes in distributions. So I did actually give this talk last year, just not at uh, DebConf, I talked to it in Cambridge. Uh, and that time I, I c covered changes up to Linux 4.14. Since then there have been another three releases and uh, Linux 4.18 is, I think, uh, likely to be out uh, next Sunday. So I'm going to talk about those uh, changes in those four releases. Um, so, lots of new kernel features coming and uh, some of them are going to need changes elsewhere in Debian and uh, I'm not going to be, the kernel team isn't going to be doing all of these things. It needs some help from other developers. Uh, a recap of the features that I talked about uh, last year and what's, what's changed there. Uh, I talked about SCED Util which is a CPU frequency uh, governor uh, this is responsible for part of the power management uh, uh, for your CPU and SCHEDUTIL, unlike older governors, is integrated with the uh, Linux task scheduler uh, which in principle allows it to make smarter decisions. Uh, it, mm, I would hope that at some point we could make this the default governor but uh, we're not, we haven't done that yet. So sadly no change. Uh, I all talked about zoned recording, which is uh, a necessary change for very high capacity hard drives using what's called shingled magnetic recording. Um, and there's a uh, utilities for controlling that called DM zoned tools. Uh, I opened a request for package last year, request for package for that last year, uh, but I haven't seen anything, uh, any movement there. So if anyone's interested in, in those uh, very high capacity SMR drives, uh, please uh, work on that. Uh, the, I talked about the uh, block layer being replaced. The block layer is a core part of kernel code that uh, manages most uh, access to uh, mass storage, hard drives, SSDs, um, USB storage devices. Um, memory cards, and so on. Uh, so the, there's a major overhaul in the uh, interface between the block layer and drivers, which uh, should allow for higher performance and other good changes. Um, the changeover has been gradual because it's just simply not possible to convert all drivers at once. Uh, so the SCSI uh, disk uh, driver uh, supports both old and new modes of operation. Uh, we changed over the default mode uh, in Debian, uh, I th think with either 4.16 or 4.17, uh, 
and it doesn't look like anyone's complained about that, so that's, that went well. The MMC uh, subsystem, which is used for uh, most uh, embedded flash and for SD cards, uh, that has uh, finally been switched over to the new block layer. Uh, MD RAID, I think, is the last big uh, kind of driver, storage driver that hasn't been switched over. Uh, there was a little bit of uh, movement on ARM graphics drivers. The Mali kernel driver, in fact, I think this had already happened by the time of my last talk, but I didn't, didn't notice. The, uh, the Mali kernel driver for ARM Mali GPUs is available under GPL. However, the user space uh, support for this GPU is, is proprietary. As a result, uh, that driver has, is, is not, has not been accepted into the Linux kernel itself and it's only packaged in the contrib section. The StatX system call, which uh, is useful for some applications, uh, is now supported by the C library since uh, glibc version 2.28, and a few applications have started using that. Um, that uh, can improve performance for some applications. So, Let's get on to the uh, actual new features. Uh, this is, uh, RISC-V is a new-ish uh, instruction set architecture. Uh, the RISC-V uh, project started in 2010, but it's only in the last few years that they finalized what the uh, instruction set will look like. It's maintained by an industry consortium and it's more or less open, the documentation is all public, and as I understand it, there are no uh, license fees, there are no essential patents that you would need to implement it. Uh, the actual implementations themselves may well be proprietary, I think, I th in fact, I think most of them are. It supports 32-bit uh, and 64-bit uh, modes, and uh, has room to extend to 128-bit. Uh, at this point, adding new 32-bit architectures seems kind of silly, so uh, the, in Debian we're only looking at the 64-bit uh, version, as RISC-5 64. Uh, there are also lots of optional features to allow for that scalability. However, there's a common feature set which has been specified uh, for uh, all processes that are meant to be meant to run general-purpose operating systems like Linux. Basic support for that was added in Linux 4.15. There's been uh, some more work then to add uh, a uh, console driver so you can actually uh, read output from the kernel and to support uh, performance, uh, performance monitoring and function tracing. Uh, I've talked several times about uh, security hardening features uh, which are not really uh, user visible features, but uh, they help to defend the kernel and re uh, reduce the impact of uh, bugs that uh, could have otherwise have very serious uh, security impact. So the timer list structure uh, in the kernel uh, is used to track timeouts, uh, work that's been delayed, work that's uh, needs to be done uh, regularly, but the timing, I the exact timing, isn't very important. Uh, in the past, this has been a very attractive target for buffer overflows uh, because it allows you to to choose. If, you, if an attacker can find a buffer overflow bug uh, that lets them overwrite a timer list, then they can choose uh, where the code flow is going to go by overriding the function pointer, and they can also give an argument to that code. Uh, the change has been to, uh, the, to always give the timeout function a pointer to the structure instead, so that reduces its usefulness to attackers. Uh, in future, uh, it's hoped that the kernel can make use of control flow integrity, which would do a kind of uh, runtime type checking. So it would be impossible to replace the function pointer with uh, uh, a pointer to anything that wasn't meant to be a timeout function. Or you could replace it, but the result would only be that the kernel would crash rather than allowing you to uh, take over uh, and, and get a privilege escalation. 
Uh, user copy is the, is the code that's used to uh, copy data from uh, user memory to kernel memory or back uh, during a system call. Uh, this obviously is very security sensitive. We don't want it to be possible to overwrite arbitrary bits of kernel memory. So uh, in, I think, Linux 3.7, um, some range checking was added to this, so uh, that would limit, that would, that would prevent buffer overflows that would go beyond the scope of one stack frame or one heap allocation. Uh, but there was no limitation there. Uh, if you had a structure that included an array um, that, was, that uh, allowed um, if you had a, had a structure with an array in it and there were some system calls that would read and write from that array uh, and there was also some sensitive data after that, the range checking would not prevent a buffer overflow into the, from the array to the following uh, data in the structure. Uh, now there's an option if you create a, uh, if kernel code creates a private heap uh, for allocating a particular type of structure, it can def define a whitelist, uh, a, a subpart of that structure for which user copy is allowed, and the, the range checks would then uh, be more, would then prevent an overflow into other sensitive parts of the structure. So now I'm going to take uh, quite a long digression. Um, to talk about uh, something that came up uh, at the beginning of this year. It's not really, uh, not really a kernel feature. It's not even a kernel bug fix. Uh, it's uh, uh, a common flaw in a lot of processes. Um, you've probably seen these uh, logos and talk about Meltdown and Spectre. Um, these are uh, problems uh, that have arisen from speculative execution in CPUs. So speculative execution is a uh, common implementation technique that allows processes to avoid waiting uh, for slow operations. Uh, at the moment, uh, processes can run hundreds of instructions in normally in the same time that it would take to read data from main memory. So uh, in the case that uh, an instruction needs to read from main memory uh, because the, the data is not in the cache, uh, you really don't want all the instructions following that to have to wait. So the idea of speculative execution is uh, you predict some of the results and, uh, and then later when you know the real results, you can decide whether to keep the result of that speculative execution or discard it. So the results are all buffered and, and if the prediction was wrong, in theory, um, no one is the wiser. No one knows that that, that prediction was wrong. However, um, that kind of misprediction can result in bypassing uh, access control uh, and it can result in um, an attacker being able to uh, maybe that an attacker can control uh, the way the uh, speculative execution would would jump to uh, different addresses. And even though the results are discarded, uh, it, that can leave a trace in memory caches. Uh, so after this mispredicted speculative execution, uh, an attacker may be able to uh, time how long it takes to access a particular area of memory that may or may not have been accessed. Uh, during the speculative execution, and then they can tell what happened, and they can uh, find out information that they wouldn't otherwise have been able to access. For example, uh, uh, encryption keys that exist in the kernel or in, uh, an an in another process. Fixing this properly is going to require quite big changes to processor design. Uh, for the moment, the best we can do is to mitigate it with microcode updates, and with updates to software, uh, in particular the kernel. Uh, the kernel is particularly important here because, of course, it's the most privileged code, uh, or some of the most privileged code running on the processor and therefore a target of attack, and also it's the piece of code that's uh, responsible for configuring the CPU. So I'll just briefly go through the, uh, the issues that we've seen. 
uh, spectre variant one, it was described as a bounds check bypass. The, in, what, happens with, what happens here is that uh, a test for whether an array index is within the bounds of the array is predicted to be true because mm, uh, an index out of range is, is in fact extremely rare and, and that, that usually works out to be right. However, the execution can continue speculatively with the out of range index in some cases. Uh, and that can result in an attacker getting information about uh, data that's outside the bounds of the array. This, uh, a, general check, a general solution for this could be done in the compiler but would have quite uh, high performance costs. So what's being done in Linux is to, uh, to uh, add a mitigation to specific uh, array lookups that are thought to be sensitive. So that's uh, that's an ongoing effort. Uh, Spectre variant two is described as branch target injection. Uh, the idea there is that uh, you can uh, train the uh, indirect branch predictor in the CPU that uh, a branch from a particular address will will you go to another particular address, uh, and that sort of works because uh, the the tests. The, the lookup based on the code address isn't precise, so you can train it by performing jumps in uh, user space code, and it will apply the same. Uh, it will apply what's been learned about that to uh, another piece of code in the kernel at a, an address that has uh, some of its bits uh, the same. Um, most CPUs on Debian release architectures were affected by this and uh, the first variant. Uh, we have mitigations on x86 power and system Z, um, which involved uh, disabling or defeating this branch predictor. Uh, and that's done in the kernel only at present, uh, possibly also in Zen. Uh, there are some additional mitigations to x86 that you, that, uh, rely on some new features added in microcode updates, uh, but those are only available if you enable the non-free section of the archive. Uh, or if you're lucky enough to get a, a BIOS or OEFI update from your hardware vendor. Meltdown was probably the most serious of these. Uh, it affected a smaller set of CPUs uh, Intel x86, some are some 64-bit uh, ARM chips, and uh, most of the recent IBM Power CPUs on x86 and ARM64, or sorry, on AMD64 and ARM64, it's been mitigated by page table isolation, uh, which means that the uh, kernel memory is no longer uh, even mapped into. Uh, uh, user space processes. So there's a, uh, a switch in the virtual memory page tables uh, whenever a, uh, a system call or interrupt happens. Uh, and on power, the, the mitigation is, uh, has been to flush the part of the uh, CPU memory cache. This really slows down system calls and interrupt handling. It's had quite a significant performance impact for, for some applications. Um, and there isn't currently a mitigation for IO386. Uh, unfortunately, there are some differences in the way interrupt handling is done between 32-bit and 64-bit x86 processors, which means that the, the mitigation on AMD64 doesn't, doesn't transfer across. And there are yet more, yet more issues uh, Spectre NG vari variant four, cool speculative store a bypass. That turned out to be, turns out to be um, partly an issue for the kernel, but mostly an issue for uh, sandboxing. So the the, the issue here is uh, if you have a if you have code that writes to an to a particular address uh, and then a few instructions later, loads from the same address, but the addresses are calculated in different ways. Um, the CPU might predict that those are actually different addresses, and therefore the, the later read uh, 
should use the, uh, will speculatively use the old value uh, stored at that address. Uh, and, there's, and in some circumstances that results in uh, leaking sensitive information. Uh, the mitigations that were already implemented for, for Spectre Variants 1 and 2 have mostly dealt with that, um, but not completely. There are some additional mitigations available on x86 now, uh, but they rely on new microcode, and they have quite a substantial performance impact. So currently those are, those are uh, applied by default in processes, processes that are using sandboxing. Uh, but there are there it has a command line kernel command line option to uh, to adjust that uh, there's a floating point uh, a leak of floating point and vector register contents uh, which affected only Intel x86 CPUs as far as we know uh, and that's significant because it can leak encryption keys from one process to another uh, thankfully, it didn't affect um, the most recent Intel CPUs uh, because they have a feature that meant Linux didn't, didn't use uh, the optimization that made this a problem. Uh, the mitigation for that is turn off the optimization. That was a relatively easy mitigation. And there are a couple of new variants of Spectre that uh, I shan't go into. So the year 2038 problem is something similar to the year 2000 problem. Uh, if, you, uh, if you're using a 32-bit Linux system, uh, then the time is represented using a 32-bit signed number, uh, number of seconds since 1970, and that will reach its highest possible value in early 2038, and then it will wrap round to a negative value, and uh, everything related to time will go horribly, horribly wrong. So, uh, hopefully most of us won't be using 32-bit systems in 2038. However, there will be embedded systems uh, being uh, built in the very near future that will uh, will need to carry on running past 2038. So, we need uh, some changes to the Linux kernel APIs and the C library that uh, will allow for 32-bit systems to use a 64-bit count of seconds. Um, all of the, as far as I can see, all or very nearly all of the kernel internal interfaces have been updated to use 64-bit time, even on 32-bit architectures. And most of the time-related system calls uh, the implementations of those uh, can be built uh, in 32-bit configurations. Uh, however, n so far, no architecture has opted into uh, building those system calls and assigning numbers to them. So it's not quite in a state where, where you can actually take advantage of this. Also, the GNU C library uh, still doesn't support uh, this um, it will it will need to be backwards binary compatible with old applications that use 32-bit time, so it will be necessary for it to support both 32- and 64-bit time interfaces at the same time, which needs quite a lot of intricate changes, and the review of that is going rather slowly. So the, it looks like at this point this is, uh, this is not going to be ready for Buster, but maybe uh, for Bookworm. Now something that I've run into uh, repeatedly is that 32-bit programs uh, on, uh, on Debian uh, are not being built with large file support. This is a similar, there was a similar issue where uh, file access interfaces used 32-bit offsets and sizes. Um, and that means, and that meant uh, you could not access files larger than two gigabytes, which seems absolutely ridiculous today. So, uh, something called the Large File uh, Large File Summit uh, defined new 64-bit interfaces for file access, uh, but they're opt-in. Uh, so there are still uh, binaries being built uh, for i386 and other 32-bit architectures in Debian, uh, 
that can't access files larger than two gigabytes. They also don't work on very large XFS file systems, which can have uh, inode numbers larger than 32 bits. So um, I do wonder whether that should be enabled by default. The connection to 64-bit time is that uh, some uh, interfaces like STAT deal with both file sizes and times, and the C library, C library uh, developers do not want to implement four different versions of those. Therefore, if you want 64-bit time, you also need to support 64-bit uh, file sizes. So I wonder whether it would make sense to change the default build flags in debugger build flags to enable both uh, large file support and large time support. Definitely something to do um, early in the release because that's probably going to shake out quite a few bugs. Now, uh, one of the uh, important features that the kernel has for containerization is user namespaces. Uh, user names, uh, with uh, user namespaces, uh, by default, any user can create their own namespace and they will be the root user in that, um, which uh, means they can control everything in that user namespace to a great degree. Uh, but they still, in principle, don't gain any, any privileges. In practice, this has exposed a lot of security bugs. So although the feature, although user namespaces are available in Debian kernel builds, uh, they're just, it's the ability of users to create their own uh, is disabled by default. Uh, most Linux file systems uh, are not robust. If you give them a disk image that is uh, carefully constructed, uh, you can exploit bugs to cause uh, buffer overflows and other other kinds of um, problems in the file system code, and then you can do whatever you want in the kernel. So for this reason, uh, the mounting of file systems is restricted in user namespaces. You can't uh, you can't you can only mount specific types of file system. And up until now, that's mostly been virtual file systems like uh, the PROC, uh, PROC file system, SIS file system, uh, and so on. Uh, recently, there has been some work to improve Fuse, the file system in user space uh, code in the kernel. Uh, the idea of Fuse is that the uh, that there's a that the main file system implementation runs as a user space server and the kernel then just takes care of uh, packaging requests from other processes and sending them, sending them over to this uh, file system server process. Uh, so there's relatively little code running the kernel and in theory now that's quite robust. So at this point uh, uh, the root user in a user namespace is allowed to mount file systems using Fuse. Uh, in theory, any file system you want could be implemented through Fuse. I had thought I read about a project to allow regular Linux kernel file systems to be rebuilt as Fuse servers, but I can't find any trace of that anymore. So either I imagined it or that project has failed. Uh, I do wonder whether it would make sense to start packaging more Fuse file systems though. This might also be useful to make auto mounting safer. Uh, if we could run the file system code for um, hot plugs devices in user space, um, and we could take advantage of the various uh, sandboxing features that are available in user space, that I think would, would reduce the, the danger from uh, hot plugged uh, untrusted devices. Uh, another change uh, back in Linux 4.15 is to SATA link power management. SATA is the high-speed serial link that is used f to connect most hard, hard drives, SSDs, um, and optical uh, disk drives. 
uh, high-speed serial links tend to draw quite a bit of power uh, as long as they're running, even when there's no data to be transferred. So generally, it's important to have link power management, which can switch them into a, a lower power mode when uh, there hasn't been any data to transfer for a while. Uh, that not only saves power on the SATA controller, but can also save quite a bit of power on some uh, Intel processors. Uh, something that's been tried uh, is aggressive link power management. I'm not quite sure what makes it aggressive, but uh, um, that, that can give much higher power savings, but it turns out that some uh, some drives simply don't don't implement this correctly, and it can result in data loss. So that has never been enabled in um, in mainline Linux. Um, what changed in 4.15 is um, the, uh, the the generic SATA uh, controller driver gained support for a mode where it in, where it sets the link power management settings similar to uh, what. Uh, Windows users um, with uh, Intel uh, SATA controllers that can save more power than the previous defaults, and we believe it's it's believed to be well tested because that's what Windows uses on uh, on most laptops. So um, uh, we enabled that power saving mode in the Debian kernel uh, study in 4.17. Um, it does look like there are, have been some uh, boot regressions related to that, though. So uh, probably some more work needed there to uh, maybe blacklist dry some drives that don't work so well with that. Um, sorry. Uh, so far as I'm aware, uh, there's no data loss here, but but um, there are have been boot hangs. Um, finally, there have been uh, quite a few changes to the packaging of the kernel uh, in Debian. Uh, as you may have seen in the previous talk about secure boots, um, we now build a template source package uh, that will be used by the signing service uh, to produce signed versions of the, the kernel and its modules. Um, we have uh, a more flexible way uh, to select in the uh, in the source package which binary packages it will build. Um, that uh, is something that's been requested uh, for use in derivatives, and I also found that useful for uh, backporting um, uh, backporting Linux 4.9 into Jesse for long-term stable. The kernel config files, uh, we provide copies of the, uh, the configuration we use uh, for the binary packages to use as a starting point for building custom kernels. Uh, those have been moved into new binary packages because uh, the way we were, previously we were including them in the Linux source dash version package. That turns out to be impossible now because the um, uh, the kernel configuration system wants to run the uh, compiler and probe the cap capabilities of the compiler. So in order for that to work, we would have needed to install lots of cross-compilers while building Linux source. Um, so I decided against that. Uh, so um, that was the solution. Uh, I've removed all the remaining dependencies on Python 2. Uh, all the Python scripts that we used to build were already switched over. Um, but I've now also changed the documentation build to use Python 3. Uh, the perf documentation build was using um, the, it was using ASCII doc, which is implemented in Python 2. That's now switched over to ASCII doctor, which is in not Python 3, but Ruby. And I think there are one or two other things, but it's all you can build without Python 2 anymore. So that's a step towards uh, removing Python 2 from the uh, from the next release. Um, there's been a config change to add ARM HF and ARM64 packages that are built with real-time support. That 
uh, hasn't yet really taken effect because we don't have a real-time patch set for 4.18 yet. But as soon as there is one, uh, those, those packages will get built. Finally, uh, all of the packaging uh, of Linux and um, other things that the kernel team takes care of, uh, all those repositories have been moved to Celsa, and um, well, we're open to merge requests. Um, I very much prefer dealing with merge requests to patches uh, attached to the bug dragging system. Um, so that's all I got. Um, any questions about these or other changes that have taken place uh, since 4.14? Anyone? Not, th not that one. No. Okay. Um, I had a question about glibc. Um, you said things seem to be moving kind of slowly on the 64-bit time front. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember, you know, when they first started implementing 64-bit file access, file offset, you know, there was a whole slew of, of libc level calls that had to mm -hmm. have 64 stuck on the end of them. Yep. Uh, is there any particular reason? I, I just now reviewed the number of the, or all the glibc calls I could find in the info docs real quick that um, take or return a time t. And it, it really doesn't seem like that big a job, famous last words. Do you know what, what the holdup is? Um, there, are, there are quite a few. Um, it's not just system calls, but there's the library calls like uh, MK time, diff time. Um, and. There are the, the ABI compatibility constraints, and there are, there's um, name issues with wh which things can be defined, uh, the names of things that can be defined uh, um, without breaking backward uh, source compatibility. Um, so, uh, I mean, it just seems like there is a template for doing this exactly this kind of transition before, with 64-bit file offsets. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here you're just, you know, if you want to support 64-bit time on 32-bit systems, well, you can just call, you know, um, as time 64. Or well, no, the idea is, in fact, with, so with LFS, you had, um, you had the 64 suffixed functions, but also you could define file underscore offset. file offset bits, it was 64, and then uh, all the uh, regular functions would get remapped by macros or whatever. Right. Um, the same thing is going to be true with, um, I think it's time offset bits, but I can't exactly remember. Okay. Um, but you said, that you said something about how they don't want to support four different configurations. Right, it'll be three different configurations. Right, okay, that's bad enough. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you. Anyone else? I guess that's it. Oh. Yep. Uh, you said there were packaging changes to do with selecting the different binary packages that were built. Uh, wh which which version did the did those land in? Um, I Roughly. think it was four point seventeen. Okay, thanks. Some of those I some of those I cherry picked back. Uh, to do the, um, the uh, Linux 4.9 in Jesse. Anybody else? That seems like an absence of hands. Um, thank you all very much, and go get your coffee early. Thanks. Bye.